so much, uh, Monish, for being here. I, before we start, I want to thank Professor Stiver at Mendoza College of oh, Business no, okay. and Mark Dumich at uh, Notre Dame Institute for Global Investing. And also, I, I want to thank Anuradha and all your staff members, Monish, for the communication. It, it was very smooth and had no problem setting everything up. That being said, with Monish, there was a recent eBay auction I saw, and I think it was a 30-minute Zoom call that sold for about $26,000, if that's right, Monish. And uh, that means this hour-long Zoom call we have with you is worth at least $52,000. And if not, probably even that is a gross underestimate if we can gather more insights from you here today. The guy who won that auction yeah. thought he got so much value that he sent $30,000 over. Just yeah, to he, just, he, he <laughs> increased the amount because he felt bad. He thought it was too low. <laughs> well, okay, folks, everyone in the classroom, then if that's the case, just be mindful, you know, when you phrase your questions, this is we're getting great value here today. So if that's okay, Monish, we'll get right into the first question, if that's all right. Yeah. And Dibs, you forgot to send me the shirt so we could be dressed the same. <laughs> I We could have planned it out. Yeah. This is uh, some exclusive Berkshire merch, but I'm sure you have, you have plenty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, you know what I do want, Monish, if that's okay, the one with the quarter zip that you have, the Tando. Oh, ones, yeah. I would, I would definitely want that. That's some exclusive merch. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Okay. So the first question, Monish, for great businesses and compounders with long runways, you've said that even when it's appropriately valued, you shouldn't sell it. And even when it's overvalued, you shouldn't sell it. That one is definitely is definitely interesting. And for I can we can think of two reasons. One if the investors have large amount of capital, like Buffett or even yourself, perhaps where there is not that many stocks to invest in, and that's why you kind of have to hold on to the compounders. And then second, we get an interest-free loan from government with no maturity. So those are the two benefits. But apart from those two benefits, why would you not sell a compounder with long runway, even when it's clearly overvalued in, in by definition? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the reasons we don't want to sell is because, first of all, these great businesses and these great compounders with long runways are very rare. We should be very grateful and thankful that we get a couple of those in our portfolio. The second is that when you have these kinds of businesses in your portfolio, figuring out intrinsic value is a non-trivial exercise. And you may actually make errors in figuring that out. So for example, I mean, let's say you owned Amazon at some point in your portfolio and uh, it looked optically overvalued. Amazon always looked optically overvalued because they're you know, putting their earnings into so many other initiatives that their earnings look artificially low when you just look at the, the basic number. And we don't know which of the bets they're making which we don't have enough visibility on, are going to work out or not work out and what the economics of those bets are going to be and so on. We would not be able to, for example, have any kind of idea about AWS before they, you know, before the whale surfaced or what the, you know, economics or long-term prospects of that business are or even other businesses that Amazon may enter in the future. So basically, I, I would say that the, the idea should be that when it's very clear that a business is egregiously overvalued, absolutely, you should sell it. But if you're just, you know, it, this is more kind of, I think, art than science. When, you're, when you get past what you think is fair value and it's something looks like, you know, it's 20, 30 percent overvalued or something, I think you have to give benefit of doubt because there are so many unknowns that could work in your favor. And, and this, is, this is especially the case with gifted management teams. I mean, at what point in Microsoft's, you know, something like 48-year history or maybe even 40-year history or so as a public company, at what point should it have been sold, right? I mean, we know that we hit that point around 2000, Right. And when it was like, you know, 600 billion, second, second most valuable business on the planet or something. But through, if you ex exclude that one bubble, which everything became crazy, where a lot of things, are, you know, deserve to be sold, is Microsoft overvalued today? 
is it egregiously overvalued? I mean, I don't know whether Microsoft is fairly priced or overpriced. It's probably somewhere in that kind of range, but I wouldn't venture to say it's egregiously overpriced. So, so I would say that the egregious overpricing becomes obvious when mm -hmm. it's happening and one can act on that, but I think uh, you need to give it a lot of rope. Mm -hmm. Just so that we, the other thing to keep in mind is that it's always good to think of it as if you're the owner of the business, or the, the founder of the business. So would a founder sell his company because they got an offer which was 20, 30% more than what they thought the business was worth? And, you know, if it's got a runway and all those things, it's probably unlikely. You know, if they got an offer of, you know, 500% of what they thought the business was worth, they'd be very happy to sell. And so I think having a founder mindset is also very useful. Monish, to that point, though, when we say we have to give benefit of the doubt, in a way, we are also giving benefit of doubt to the management team and believing that they will continue to throw things on the wall and, you know, hopefully produce that rate of return that they have been, right? We, we are putting faith in that, in a sense, in the history of that. Okay. Okay, just to be clear. And, and another thing to keep in mind is, so when you do that, the risk that you run is that a business that you thought is great might go into decline, right? So let's say you've had a 30X or a 50X on some business, you've held it for a long time, it's been a great return, and you don't spot the exact moment when the business goes into decline. So you may sell it at a 20% or 30% discount from the peak valuation. There are far worse tragedies than that in life. You know, we are okay if we don't capture the last dollar and we don't optimize. But I think the down the downside of actually getting off a great runway is much, much worse, actually. So so to conclude, even when we don't see a clear path to how this valuation could be justified, because like with Amazon and AWS, there's so much internally going on that we don't know we're we're going to trust it. Yeah, I mean, I would. I, I mean, I haven't looked at Amazon's market cap lately, but uh, let's say, for example, in fact, let me just take a quick look at what Mr. Market is putting for Amazon today, and then we can maybe have a little bit of an intelligent conversation about this great business. So, Amazon's market cap is about one point three trillion today. I mean, I would say that if I were a owner of Amazon it would not bother me if the market cap was $2 trillion or even $2.5 trillion. I would give it a lot of rope because I think that they have such an ability to enter new businesses and such an ability to execute. And any of those embryos that we can't even see could become big in the future. But I would just give them a lot of rope and take the risk that we may eventually end up selling at, you know, something less than those numbers. But if you've had a good uh, run for a long time, it's still okay. okay. Okay, thank you very much. And so turn it over to the classroom. I think Arnav, you would like to go and ask your question. Hi, um, I was just curious, um, when you exited Transtech, what pushed you to start your own investment fund? Uh, versus like investing in any of the already existing value funds? I didn't fully get the question. You said when I left Transtech, can you just repeat that again? Yeah, like what pushed you to start your own value fund versus putting your money in like an already existing fund? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So actually, when I was at that crossroads in 99, what I really wanted to do was I, I wanted to go work for Warren Buffett. That was my goal in life. And at that time, you know, my my liquid net worth was like, north of 10 million maybe which i thought was you know a huge amount of money i'd never had any anything like that in in the stock market and so on maybe 10 12 million so i felt like okay i don't need to work anymore i think i and i don't need to get a paycheck anymore and what do i want to do and i said what i want to do is continue to get better at investing and how do i get better at investing well you know go apprentice with warren buffett and so I wrote Warren a letter in 99, probably January or February of 99. And I basically told him, listen, this is my background and I don't need a salary or anything. And 
I can work in Omaha or Chicago where I was living at the time. And, uh, you know, you can pretty much tell me to do anything, including sweep the floors. It's okay. Uh, and I don't need a title or anything. And uh, actually within a week, I got a response from Warren, which means that my letter probably got responded to in Omaha, maybe the same day or the next day after it got there. And he basically said that I work alone and I like working alone. And then he said, now you might wonder why I'm saying that when there's Charlie Munger in the picture. And he said, Charlie's in LA and I'm in Omaha. So we don't really on a day-to-day -day basis work together. And so he says his exact words were, good luck reorganizing your life. I'm not the answer. Okay. So I was very depressed and dejected when I got that letter because I could not think of anything else I really wanted to do. I didn't, could not think of any other place I wanted to go work. And I had some friends. I was part of a group called Young Presidents Organization, YPO. And I had some friends in YPO and they, you know, I used to give some of these guys talk tips over the years and they had done really well with those, those tips and so on. So they said, look, why don't you just set up a partnership like Buffett had and we don't want stock tips from you. We want to give you some money to manage. And you manage that money and, you know, see what you can make of it. And they were proposing to, they were like eight or nine of them giving me $100,000 each. So I would have like a million dollars under management, which I didn't think was enough to, you know, pay the rent or anything. And, but I didn't need, I didn't need income. So I said, okay, I can set up a vehicle like the Buffett partnerships to take care of my friends, 1 million. And if I'm buying a stock for my portfolio, there's no additional work involved in buying it for this second portfolio. It's like, you know, five minutes more work or something. So I started that not so much as a, you know, kind of plan B because Buffett said no, but because I said, okay, I can do this, but this doesn't solve my problem, but let me see what I can, else I can do. And then about, about 15 months after I started the fund, which I really thought of as a hobby, I didn't even think it was like a real business. We had done really well. The first year we were up like 70%. Uh, the fund had some more money come in. It had about two and a half million under management in 2000. And I decided at that point that I was actually enjoying the fact that I had some investors and I had this pool of capital. So I said, why don't I stop treating it as a stepchild and start treating it like a real business and, you know, raise assets and uh, run it more professionally, you know, if you will. And so I did that and I basically decided I'm going to try to grow and scale for Brian Investment Funds. And so that's how I went down that path. Thank you, Monish. And for the next question, it's regarding cigar butt investing specifically. So you know, Graham did it, Buffett did it, Walter Schloss did it, even you did it at a point. So, you know, was the, so, you know, I know you would say that compound finding compounders is the best, but sticking to cigar butt investing, if in a situation we have three stocks, you know, A, B, C, A, B, and C, and their net nets are all trading at, let's say one tenth their value. And we found these three stocks. So we buy three, 33% in each stock, just keep it, keep it to three stocks. And, uh, you know, we go to sleep for two years and then wake up and find that one of the stocks has gone up as uh, quadrupled, essentially. So it's now trading at 40, 50% of its net value, net, let's say. And the other two are just uh, coastlining, really nothing, doing nothing. In this scenario, does the concept of portfolio rebalancing make sense? Because there's more room to go, more puff left in the other two compared to this uh, one stock. Would that make sense to trim that and pour it over the other two stocks? Yeah. So I think to answer your first question about, you know, whether to do net net investing or to just focus on compounders and so on. In investing, it's always good to have a Swiss army knife approach to investing where you can maintain flexibility. So um, finding great compounders at compelling prices doesn't happen that often. And, and, you know, this year when Buffett's letter came out, uh, you know, he talked about the fact that in 58 re years of running Berkshire Hathaway, there were 12 decisions that he made that really ended up 
probably creating 80, 90% of the value for Berkshire. And he took hundreds of decisions in the last 58 years, probably more than three, probably bought more than 300 stocks. And there were really just a few stocks and a few businesses and the hiring of Ajit Jain, which were these 12 great decisions, which led to this tremendous outcome. So he said like, it, it was like one good decision every five years on average, right? So even for a person with the talents of Warren Buffett, finding these great you know, businesses like a Geico or a Coke or a Amex or Burlington Northern or all of these things that have worked so well, National Indemnity and so on, were rare. They happened relatively infrequently. And so I think it's always nice to have more tools in your arsenal that you can deal with. One of the things that did not get so much clarity or publicity properly about what Buffett did recently was that on his birthday in 2020, August 30th, Berkshire announced that they had taken more than a 5% stake in five Japanese trading companies, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Marubeni, Sumitomo, and so on. And he had invested, I think, north of about $5 billion in all these five companies. And they were forced to disclose because they went over 5%. And what he did, interestingly, when he made this bet is that he borrowed the entire amount. So Berkshire is sitting on a large amount of cash, but he borrowed the entire amount in yen at a half a percent a year long term. And these five companies had average dividend yields of about 8%. So basically, he made a $5 billion bet, putting no money down. The dividends were going to be about you know, $400 million a year. And the interest he was paying was $25 million. Okay, so $375 money or uh, $75 million of easy money coming in, you know. And when we fast forward three years now, you know, he's increased that stake, but the dividends have all doubled. And the stocks have doubled to quadrupled. Okay, so basically that $5 billion that he put in became about like 12 or 13 billion or something collectively. And instead of making 400 million a year, now he's making 800 million a year on those bets. So it was a huge home run. And he did it because I think, and maybe it took him some time to understand the nature of these companies and so on. I looked at the, I looked at these companies. Buffett intends to hold these businesses for a long time. He says, well past after he's gone. Berkshire will continue holding them, right? Now, they don't fit the perfect template of great compounders. Uh, you know, they have some dividends, they're buying back shares, they have this huge smorgasbord of assets all over the world. It's really not really, you know, clean story like you might have with Amazon or Salesforce or, you know, something like that, or Berkshire Hathaway, for that, for that matter. But this was classically what I would call part of the Swiss, Swiss Army now, right? This was a bet that if you think about the way he made that bet, the odds that he would actually lose money on that was very low. There was no currency risk. The yields were so much higher. If you study the stock prices of all these companies, basically they were hitting multi-year lows in 2020 when he bought them. And Japan in general has still not hit the highs that it had in 1990. So we had 33 years after the bubble. We haven't hit that same mark yet. It's still 30, 40% discount. So I think that when you look at net nets or you look at the Japanese bets he made or, you know, you know, merger arbitrage or any number of things you could do, convertible bonds, whatever else you could do in the stock market, it's good to maintain flexibility. So in your example, you know, you make a basket bet with some net nets and, you know, one works out and two have flatlined. Well, it's hard to answer the question that way. You really have to kind of peel the onion some more, understand those businesses some more and say, well, do the other two continue to be undervalued or is there something structurally wrong with them or are they melting ice cubes? What's going on, right? And so, yeah, if you 
uh, get an opportunity and with small amounts of capital doing these other things can work out really well. But I would say that it's always good to have an eye out on the compounders. That's kind of plan A. And if plan A doesn't work, then, you know, we have plan B, plan C, plan D, and so on. So we can play these Mickey Mouse games on the side while we're waiting for plan A. And, and that can work out just fine. One is to be fair for folks who are early in their careers and just maybe still in school. Uh, finding a compounder is not, you know, would they even have the, ins would we even have the insight to find a compounder and truly understand a business that well? Would, wouldn't it take maybe 10, 15, 20 years of studying and, you know, building knowledge and information before we can even try that? Actually, you know, it is not that hard to find great businesses and compounders. And there's a hack you can do to get them. I'm going to give you the hack. So you can, you know, you can go straight to the promised land. So the hack is make a list of all the brands that you are a customer of. Okay. So if you eat at McDonald's once in a while, add that to the list. If you go to Chipotle once in a while, add that to the list. If you are buying a certain clothing line, your headphones are a certain brand, you know, you're using uh, certain types of perfume. So look at everything you spend money on, okay? And just make a list because the thing is that for some company to succeed in getting even a tiny part of your spending is a huge accomplishment. Because all of us are very discerning about what we want. We are very particular about, you know, I want to wear certain types of shoes. I want to wear certain types of socks. I want to, you know, buy certain kinds of furniture or buy certain appliances. I, I'm buying a Samsung phone or an iPhone or whatever. So just make a list of everything you are consuming, right? And then start saying, okay, which of these are listed public companies, right? And now let's understand why, ask yourself, why did I go to McDonald's? Okay, why didn't I go to, you know, Carl's Jr. or some other brand, like Whataburger or whatever? And, uh, and then, you know, let's probe into McDonald's and see what kind of business it is. Is, is it undervalued? What kind of, because if you're a consumer of the business, you already know a lot about it. And, and you don't even need to get to the balance sheets and all that right now. Just basically in your head, what you would ask is, where is this business going? You know, is it really going to explode? You know, there's a new line of new brand of sneakers on. You know, I saw people wearing on sneakers. I'm not lucky enough to have on sneakers yet. But I read an article that it was really exploding in kind of sales. And for whatever reason, people have an interest in that. So I would just be curious to understand what is going on there, right? And, and what kind of business is it? And why would it be sustainable or not sustainable and so on? So I think that if you take that approach and this, you know, Peter Lynch was a big advocate of this approach, it's going to get you relatively close because you're going to, and especially what you'll find is sometimes you latch onto brands that are just emerging, you know, before they've really, you know, like college students were the very first demographic to got, get rid of landlines. Okay, so some of you don't know what I mean by landline. That's okay. You can be forgiven for that. But when people started disconnecting landlines, the very first demographic that did that was college students. So college students were able to see that landlines are going away. They were probably also the first to disconnect from cable or from satellite TV. Okay. So, both, it, so when the behavior patterns are changing, you know, you sign on to some streaming platform for, for some content, chances are you guys may be ahead of the curve versus the rest of the crew, right? When Facebook first started, it was only for a few colleges. 
right? Only it first started at Harvard and then expanded from there. So basically those individuals who were early customers of Facebook or consumers of Facebook has a huge advantage because the rest of the world didn't even know what Facebook is. They never used it. So, so you're actually at Notre Dame at a huge advantage to Warren in Omaha, you know, massive advantage because he's not changing anything about what he's doing. Whereas you guys are actually driving change. And so very easy to find a compounder. I gave you the formula. That that works, Monish. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, turning it back over to the classroom, we have another student that wants to ask a clear question. Yeah, so they have heard of Charlie's thinking and subsequently yours has to do with like multidisciplinary thinking and using a number of different mental models. So I was wondering if you need advice for like us students without decades of experience, like how we go about developing that skill set and then subsequently applying it as well. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great question. And, you know, Charlie is a great collector of models and he's really good. Actually, the amazing thing about the way his brain works is how he can immediately like recall or bring to bear, you know, four or five different models almost instantly. So he's practiced that a lot. But if you, if you go through the book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, you know, the back of the book, they have the 10 great speeches he's given. And one of the speeches is the psychology of human misjudgment. And he modified that talk. The original talk was given at Harvard. And the original talk is on the internet, et cetera. So you don't even need to spend $2. You just ask God Google and God Google will give you all of that content for free. And so... I try to read that essay every year and that essay contains a good 30 plus models. And they give you, uh, that essay gives you a lot of insights into how our brains function. And that gives you a lot of big leg up in how you can, you know, figure things out, et cetera, right? So for example, in that essay, he talks about association tendency. Association tendency is used by companies like Coca-Cola, where Coca-Cola wants to be any place where humans are happy. So if there's the Olympics or the World Cup or, or the NFL or NFL game or a movie theater, any place where humans are happy, Coke wants to be there. And Coke is willing to do whatever it takes, loss leader, whatever, to be there for, for that purpose. And the association tendencies are very strong. So when we see Coke in a happy setting, it carries on to other areas of life where we want Coke with us because we think if we have a Coke, we're going to be happy, right? So Coke uses that in the advertising. They also use celebrities in their advertising, right? For the same reason, you know, if, you know, if some, you know, Brad Pitt is, you know, drinking a certain band brand of beer. That's the brand of beer I need to be drinking, you know, and that sort of thing. And so he goes through a number of models. So I think it took Charlie probably 30 or 40 years of stumbling around in the darkness to come up with those particular models. He basically distilled it down in that talk. So what took him 30 or 40 years you could absorb in a day or two, which is tremendous leg up on Charlie. And, they, you know, so there are quirks in the wiring of the human brain. And it's very important to understand those quirks because once you start understanding those quirks, you can get a huge leg up on other humans. So for example, humans have built in to our brains this reciprocation tendency that if someone does us a favor, we feel that we need to do them a favor. And so the reciprocation tendency is built into most humans. And Charlie thinks it comes from going very way back in our evolutionary history. So when we, were, when we lived in hunter-gatherer societies and there was a hunter who brought down a big beast, right? He brings it to his small group now he cannot consume the whole beast himself and there's no refrigeration. 
So what he does is he stores that meat in the bellies of his neighbors. And he invites them all to share in his feast. So later when one of them brings down a beast, they know they're going to invite him. You know, he knows he's going to get invited, right? And so it works to win for everyone. But there's a quirk in the reciprocation tendency is that because of the way our evolutionary brains evolved, the reciprocation tendency etched into our brain does not have a calibration engine. So I can remember that John did a favor for me but I'm really not good at calibrating the size of the favor. And Cialdini talks about it, you know, the psychology of persuasion, that salespeople use this all the time in a way to take advantage of people or, you know, get more sales, et cetera. And I've used this tendency to increase assets in Pabrai funds, for example. So when, when a potential investor approaches me and says, hey, I'm interested in investing in Pabrai funds, for example, everything they need to make that investment could be sent to them by email, you know, various documents and prospectus and disclosures and whatever, right? And they can look at that, et cetera. And we do that. We send them all the information digitally. But, but what we also do is we send them a physical package, okay? And the physical package has all the same documents in hard copy, but it also has some giveaways, right? So it has a book usually, and it has a very nice cross pen, okay? And now when the person receives the package, he gets this very nice cross pen, which he never asked for. He doesn't even want it, but it's there now, and the book is there. Now, maybe one out of one or two out of a hundred people I would send these packages to return the whole package to me with a note saying, thank you, Mr. Pabrai, for sending these documents and, you know, all these things. I decided it's not for me and warm regards, right? Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get rid of the reciprocation obligation. And, but for 98% of humans, there's too high a frictional cost to try to return that package. You know, you've got to go to UPS and all of that. It's a complicated thing. It's not so easy. And so if they don't return the package, now it's like they ate my meat, okay? They ate the beast I gave them. And so they feel obliged. And if you feel obliged, then the minimum investment is a few million dollars, you know? So you can send a few million dollars and now we're even, you know? And so... The pen is equal to a few million dollars because the brain cannot calibrate, right? And so that's a mental model that is useful. Now, there are used car salesmen, scumbag salesmen who take advantage of this in nefarious ways, right? And But you can take advantage of it in very above board ways. And so being aware of these quirks in the way human brains are wired is going to give you an advantage in life. So as you go through life and as you learn about different things and as you say, oh, like for example, one of the things that has helped me a lot is, you know, I'm the shameless cloner, you know, and I have still not figured out. So I know that humans, for whatever reason, have an aversion to cloning They consider it beneath them. They think it's like cheating or whatever, right? I really don't know why there is a human aversion to cloning. What I do know is it definitely exists because a lot of people will look at something that somebody else is doing and they'll decide, oh, that's a good idea, but it's already been done. So there's no point me trying to copy it or it won't work, whatever. Else. They don't copy it. A really good example of that is, you know, when I first ran into Chipotle, you know, the restaurant we all love. So when I first ran into Chipotle, I loved it. It was great. You know, I'm, I'm talking like about 20 years ago. And I used to go every day and have my lunch at Chipotle because I just, creature of habits, you know, keep it simple. 
And Chipotle had a particular innovation in the way Mexican food was being served, which is that they allowed extreme customization. And no two people in line ordered the same thing, right? And because of the way their whole assembly line was set up, it was very easy to customize, right? Because they just go down the line and ask you what you want and you just keep telling them and you go. And I said, this is a great innovation. I looked, thought about it, I thought about 20 years ago, 22 years ago. I said, this is a fantastic innovation. Then I would go to Baja Fresh, okay? And they just give you some standard burrito or standard taco. You know, you cannot, you can add, tell them, oh, you know, change this, add that, but it's not a seamless experience. And Baja Fresh has not scaled. And what I couldn't figure out is I said, I, I saw when there was Baja Fresh and I saw when there was Chipotle. And if I was the CEO of Baja Fresh, what I would have done is I would have just completely cloned Chipotle. I'd make everything the same, exactly the way Chipotle did. And there's room for more than one, okay? There's not room for just one. And now, you know, we have some other restaurants like Kava, et cetera, that have come up with the same concept with different kinds of food, right? But there could have been more of the same. Nobody really cloned McDonald's fries. Like, why are you not cloning those fries? Those fries are great. Okay, it's not rocket science. Let's clone it. Nobody cloned the Egg Mac McMuffin. Why are you not cloning the Egg McMuffin? It's great. Okay, just because you didn't invent it doesn't mean you can't clone it. Okay, and so I find continuously around the world, when I look around, that there are so many opportunities but for doing what has already been done. There's no need to make any changes to what has already been done because there's room for two or three players or four players easily in what has already been done. But nobody does that. And that's just the way, we, way the world works. So embracing a mental model like cloning. So what I when I realized that humans have some weird aversion to cloning, what I said is, okay, Monish, if you become the shameless clone, right off the bat, you will have an advantage, okay? And that advantage, because other people are not willing to do that, is going to give you a huge leg up. And uh, I remember in uh, 2012, I noticed that Berkshire Hathaway in their 13F filing had bought General Motors, you know, uh, General Motors stock. And I also noticed that, I think it was David Einhorn, who had bought GM stock, okay? I always hated the car business. I think the car business is a horrible business. You know, high capex, unions, we see what the unions are doing right now. And you're subject to consumer taste. And if something is even slightly off, they won't buy your car. And, you know, all of these things is very competitive and all of that, right? It's a horrible business to be in. So I said, why would these smart people want to go into a business which is worse than having a root canal. You know, like why would you want to invest in a stupid business like General Motors? And what I decided to do was I said, I'm just going to dig into this to understand what drugs these people were smoking. So I decided I was going to study GM to try to come up with an answer of why these smart people bought GM, right? And when I started to study it, I realized that the auto business had changed and it had changed in a very major way. And I was not aware that it had changed. So what happened in, in the auto business is in the financial crisis in 2008 and 09, GM and Chrysler went through bankruptcy. And when they went through bankruptcy, they got rid of their legacy liabilities. They got rid of their debt. They got cleansed out of all the sins of the past. And I read a book called Overhaul, which was written by Steve Ratner, who was the auto czar appointed by President Obama to basically fix the auto industry. And he was basically responsible for the US government bailout of 
GM and Chrysler and managing those companies to come back to health. And when I read his book, Overhaul, which is a great book to read, I realized that so every five years, like, like we are seeing right now, the UAW renegotiates the union contracts. And they have a lot of leverage because they'll go on strike. And if they go on strike, you know, obviously the company are in a lot of pain, right? Like they've just struck so many of their plants and distribution centers. If you take your car in now, they can't get the parts because the distribution centers are all on strike. The people are all on strike. So in, in 2009, I think that the auto task force in DC, Steve Ratner and his colleagues were going to Detroit to meet with some of the leaders of GM and Ford and GM and Chrysler and so on. And they had a meeting with the UAW at about 4 p.m. and their flight was going to be leaving at 5 p.m. So when they met the UAW, they said, look, we're going to redo the contracts because what is there in place right now is not sustainable. And they said that we've actually come up with a new contract with how things are going to work. And here is a new contract. And on the last page, you can sign and then we can move on. So the UAW, basically the leadership told them that, listen, I don't think you understand how things work in Detroit. We appreciate that you've come up with a new contract. We will take this and study it. And just for me seeing the first few paragraphs of what you've written, I can assure you none of it is going to be acceptable to us. And we will come back to you in a few weeks with a counter proposal. And then we'll go from there. Okay. So Steve Radner says to the UAW leadership at that point, he says, my plane leaves in 40 minutes. And if in 35 minutes you have not signed this contract without so much as changing a comma, I will shut the city down tomorrow. So he says, I don't particularly care if you go on strike or not. And I don't particularly care whether you come to work or not. The companies need U.S. government money to stay alive. And the U.S. government is not going to be putting up, putting in a penny unless this contract is done exactly the way it's written. And the UAW, for the first time in its history, signed that contract on the spot without changing a comma. And I went to God Google. And I pulled up that contract. And it was the most orgasmic piece of reading that I had done in a very long time. And they are now fighting to take out those conditions that were put in 2009 that are still there in the contracts now. But what I realized when I read that contract is that Detroit used to be the best place on the planet to make cars. And the reason was that all the factors of production were right there. And the Great Lakes were right there to transport everything really cheaply. So you had huge iron ore deposits around the Great Lakes. You had huge coal deposits. You had huge steel mills. You had a huge auto parts industry all in that Great Lakes ecosystem, very efficient transportation. And Detroit was one of the only places on the planet that has all of that, all of that stuff in one place. And then the labor became so extreme that it became the worst place to make a car. And the Koreans and the Japanese and all of them took over that industry, became a lot more efficient. And what had happened with that revised contract is that Detroit had again become the best place to build a car. And I realized that there was a major change. So I went from hating the auto industry to loving the auto industry, just because I had no aversion to cloning. And I just decided that even though I have to hold my nose and read up on GM, I'll hold my own nose and read up, okay, just to understand. And, and then what actually ended up happening is that, which is another thing, a great model is sometimes you will see a company and you don't understand why some investor made that investment. You study it, but then you find another company in the same industry that's even better. So I studied GM, I studied Ford, and I studied Chrysler. And then I realized when I studied Chrysler that Fiat Chrysler had been, there had been an acquisition by Fiat was 
an incredible business because they had a rock star man manager, Sergio Marchioni. And if, you know, I in hindsight, I sold too soon. That's why I say that, you know, these compounders. So the entire market cap of Fiat Chrysler in 2012 was five or $6 billion. It was a company with 135 billion in revenue with 5 billion of market cap. And it had been cleansed. A lot of the debt was gone. And within that five or six billion was 80% of Ferrari. And Ferrari, if you look at it today, has a 50, $60 billion market cap. So uh, they went public a few years later. So the stock was at like, you know, five or $6. Basically, Ferrari is about $300 a share right now. At that time, the effective value of Ferrari was about $15 a share. That was embedded in there. So I never paid much attention to Ferrari because I was interested in the Ram franchise and the Jeep franchise, which was so strong. And the Ram and Jeep franchise were both capable of producing more than 5 billion a year in cash flow. So I had a business which was at 5 billion market cap. You had two franchises. You could eliminate the rest of the business and you would be making 10 billion a year. But they also had the minivan franchise, which was also really good. And they own Maserati and they own Alfa Romeo, the whole bunch of other things that they owned. It was, and they own Ferrari and they own these parts companies and all of that. So in the end, in the end, this 5 billion market cap, when you ran it through, became more than a hundred billion between Fiat and between Ferrari and the rest of the pieces. And it all came out of basically, because I, I took a position, I took a 10% position, I held it and so on. It all came out of, wanting to understand why someone did something. And I realized that nobody else would do that. Nobody else would actually look at GM that Ted Wexler bought and ask the question why, right? And so it's really important. So if you look at the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio today, very recently, they have bought a bunch of home builders, Lennar and Pulte and a few others. They probably bought a bunch because the amount of money they want to put in, they needed a basket. And I know that if you study it, you will come to an aha moment. Because what the Lenars of the world have started doing is they've copied, finally, after more than 20 years, they've copied the NVR model. So aversion to cloning, NVR, the home builder, which had a great model, they bought back like 85% of their stock, they stopped issuing dividends and all that. It took these other home builders. NVR in the last 25 years has been an 800 bagger. Okay, it's gone up 800 X. It's a stupid home builder. Okay, it's not chat GPT or something. Okay, so it's gone up 800 X. And the others in the industry for more than 20 years, they watched them do so much better than them. And none of them adopted that model. Till finally, after 25 years, they said, I can't take it anymore. And they finally succumbed after 25 years. And now they've started cloning the NVR model. And I think Berkshire saw that. And they said, let's go party. So that's another model that can be helpful. And I'm sorry for the long-winded answer. I think I think the French fry thing is absolutely true, Monish. Every every company should follow McDonald's French fries. Yeah, why? What's, <laughs> what's what's so hard about it? You know what you can do. You know what you can do. You can incognito become a McDonald's employee, and you can make those French fries. You can extract every bit of the intellectual property, and just clone it. Right. <laughs> Not happening because humans have these screwed up brains. What can yeah. I say? Uh, well, Notre Dame will be the first to do it. There's a student-run organization. <laughs> All right, that's great. <laughs> All right. And uh, so, Monish, we have one student waiting to ask her question, and she would like to go and ask a question. Hi, can you talk about the parallels between bridge and investing, and if you have any bridge hacks or strategy? Are you a bridge player? I am, but I keep on losing to, like, 90-year-olds and 95-year-olds. Are you, are you, do you play duplicate bridge? I'm like, okay. I'm like pretty, I'm like an intermediate player, I would say. But, but you play duplicate and you play online or live? Live. Live. Okay. Are they like the local bridge clubs and so on? Yeah. 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 
So, well, that's actually excellent. I think it's, you know, the sad part about bridge is that we have more people dying who play bridge than new people, young people who are starting to play bridge, which is really sad. But yeah, I mean, I think that I remember, uh, you know, I, I first started playing bridge when I was, I was about 23 years old. I think about, it was like about 25, 26 years ago. And I just loved the game. And at that time there was no online bridge. And I used to go to the local clubs and play. And I remember the first time I went, and you know, I had always been a topper in math and understood probabilities and all of that. And I'd never been in a math class that I was not the best student. This had never happened in life. And so I said, okay, this is, you know, we're going to have so much fun with this. So I went to a bridge club and I remember I, I was playing with this couple, like you were describing the 90 year old couple that was playing with this couple. And this guy had an oxygen tank. Okay. So, you know, he's an oxygen tank, you know, and he's really old and frail on a wheelchair and so on. And I said, you know, I really hate to beat these people, but, you know, somebody's got to do it. What can I say? And then they proceeded to make mincemeat out of me. You know, like I was just shattered, you know, and like the, the scores they got and all of that. And that made me do a double take. I say, okay, you know, go back to square one and find another gear, you know, learn some more. So Definitely with bridge, I think experience and, you know, duration of time that you play it because you start seeing more and more patterns is going to be very helpful to you. But it's a great game because it takes 15 minutes to learn and a lifetime is not enough to master it. And now that we have bridge base, which is an online platform, as well as, you know, the, the live bridge and the local clubs and all of that. So I think the way to get better at bridge is first of all, you know, so there's some great books. You keep, you know, reading those books and the ACBL bulletins with all the different tips and puzzles and all of that. And the other thing that can really be helpful is to play with someone. So, you know, I have two kinds of folks that I play with. I play with some teachers who are really exceptional and I play with some peers who are at my level or so. And it's really when I'm playing with someone who's far better than me, that the learning is really on a good accelerated pace. So it's really important to have a great teacher or coach and to absorb from them and learn from them. And I enjoyed a lot. I mean, I probably spend maybe five or six hours a week playing bridge and uh, I'd be happier if it was more. And uh, I now, after more than 20 years, I started going to the live tournaments. So we have three national tournaments in the U.S. every year, every four months. And I decided I'm going to basically try to attend all three of them, at least for three, four days or five days or something. The next one's in Atlanta, so I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, what a wonderful hobby to have. Not expensive. A bridge base is like $99 a year, plus maybe $1 or $2 per game. So it's very relatively cheap entertainment. and it is really helpful, I think, for an investor to play bridge. Both investing and bridge are games centered on probability. So we don't really have absolutes in investing. Everything you will look at will have some hair on it. You know, some there's some probabilities. You know, what happens at Amazon if Andy Jassy is not there? You know, or what happens? if the FTC succeeds in, you know, putting some handcuffs on them, you know, whatever. So we always have things that can come from left field. And so we always, it's really investing in a probabilistic exercise. And bridge is very much a probabilistic exercise because we are continuously evaluating odds and the odds are continuously changing as the cards are played. And so to the extent that your brain becomes better and better at probability calculations and thinking probabilistically, it can be very helpful. So I don't think it's a coincidence that Buffett and Munger and many other great investors are bridge players. But now I run into a lot of investors who don't play bridge because it's kind of not regarded as so cool anymore. 
But I would encourage all of you actually to take up the game. I think you will get an incredible amount of joy and satisfaction and entertainment out of it. And you'll become a better investor. So it tastes great and it's less filling. Okay, great. Thank you, Monish. And before we end, would we have to mention Dr. Kind of Foundation. I feel like it's customary now. And in your recent talk with Med Favor, you mentioned that there will be a point, ideally, when 12% of the admitted students in IIT would be from Dakshina, uh, so about one eighth. And after you reach that point, what would be, I mean, because, you know, you know, you're going to reach there. So, and we all hope you reach there. So what would be the vision afterwards? And how would you want to funnel your uh, capital towards other social causes? It's a very good question. I don't know the answer right now. And one of the problems in so I think Dakshina, we lucked out. We lucked out that there was the IITs and this whole ecosystem and we could leverage that. Nobody was doing it, et cetera. But it's going to cap out, right? So once we are spending about, we, we currently spend about $3 million a year. Once we are spending about 7 or $8 million a year, we will have maxed out. I, I don't think we can spend more than that. So first, our spending needs to get to the seven eight million, which is a high-class problem. That's great. We, I think we'll get there in a few years. If, if I had let's say 20 or 30 million a year to give away, for example. One of the problems in philanthropy and charity is that finding great causes and generating great social returns is much harder than finding compounders. Okay, so the compounders are a cakewalk compared to once you enter the realm of charities and you know all of that, because the, the, the problem, I mean, let's take the problem of homelessness in LA, for example, okay? Huge problem or homelessness in San Francisco. If, you know, I was given that problem to solve, I can assure you I will fail, okay? A lot of smart people have put a lot of money against that problem and they failed. It's a very difficult problem to solve, okay? And these other problems, you know, environment, healthcare, you know, education, poverty, illiteracy, all these things, each one of them is really difficult not to crack. So I'm experimenting with a few things always just to see that, you know, can this scale up or can that scale up? And so far, these experiments have not led to something that I can say, oh, here's the second model. So once we hit 8 million, we can do this model and this can carry us. I have not hit that point yet. But I think what I will be forced to do is I will have to reduce my expectations. It's just like Berkshire Hathaway, right? Basically, when Warren was managing 1 million, he says he would do 50% a year. And when he's managing, you know, 600 billion, he's barely able to beat the S&P. You know, it's a big, it's a big difference. So as we grow at Dakshana, I think we will have to lower the bar of what we would consider acceptable. So we may have to find some cause which definitely does good for society, but it doesn't do it at the level that what we're doing today. What we're doing today really is magical. And I don't think, I, I think we would be extremely lucky if we ever find another thing that is so magical. It's just difficult. And, and we'll that's not, we'll, we'll still try. We'll see what we can do. Yeah, and, and that's not just you saying it. It's also Warren saying it's one of the best uh, well-written reports ever he's read for a nonprofit. So yeah, that's great. Well, Monish, I think we're essentially out of time, but obviously we would, you know, stick around forever if you would like to continue, but we would like to respect your time and the time with the students and folks in the classroom. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, Monish. Thank you.